Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. On September 1, 2006, Roger Goodell assumed duty of NFL commissioner, ultimately becoming the most powerful person in American sports. This week's guest released a book the same year that Commissioner Goodell assumed the throne. The topic of his book tells a story about how the NFL almost folded back in the mid-40s, which would never have given Goodell a chance to be dubbed the most powerful person in American sports. And it all revolved around World War II. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off for DeLorean, the date is December 7th, 1941, and we are in the parking lot of New York Giants Polo Grounds. And... We have a special guest riding shotgun with us, baby. His name is Matthew Algio. Matthew is an award-winning journalist that has reported from four continents, and his stories have appeared on public radio's All Things Considered, Marketplace, and Morning Edition. He is the author of five books, Abe and Fido, Harry Truman's Excellent Adventure, Pedestrianism, The President is a Sick Man, and the book that we're interested in today. Last Team Standing, How the Steelers and the Eagles, the Steels, saved pro football during World War II. This book won the 2006 Nelson Ross Award from the Pro Football Researchers Association, which recognizes his outstanding achievement in pro football research and historiography. You can pick up any of these books through the Amazon links in the show notes. And let's just say these books are obscurely intriguing, and if you have an inquisitive mind that gets sucked into thought-provoking stories, then I suggest you check out his work. But you better catch him quickly because he's moving to Bosnia in July. And I tell you what, that's a long swim across the pond if you want to give him a solid fist bump, or even a bear hug for dropping golden knowledge nuggets all over the place. But without further ado, I present to you Matthew Algio. Matthew, welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, and thanks for riding shotgun with me, man. <laughs> You're welcome, Art. It's great, great to be with you. Awesome. Tell me, tell me this. Why is December 7th, 1941 so significant to the NFL? Well, of course, that is the day that the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and uh, marked America's entry into World War II. It was also the last Sunday of the 1941 NFL season, and there were three games that day. Uh, There were games in Chicago, in Washington, and New York. And so a lot of people, uh, their their last amusement before the war was a pro football game, was an NFL game. And a lot of people, thousands, uh, learned about the bombing of Pearl Harbor, either while they were at an NFL game or while they were listening to an NFL game on the radio. And so, uh, in a way, December 7th, 1941 is a, a date that's also linked to the history of the NFL because with the onset of World War II, the NFL had a whole series of challenges it had to face. And uh, that was the beginning of that challenge. So, if, if that was the beginning of the challenge, what are we talking about here? Going from, I'm a fan at the New York Polo Grounds with you. We're sitting there. We're in the 50-yard line. And what do you think went through their minds when they heard this? You said it was over the loudspeakers or something? Yeah, 
it was announced in New York, I believe, but it was never announced in Washington. George Preston Marshall, who was the owner of the Redskins at the time, and of course, there were a lot of bigwigs at the Redskins game because it was Washington. Uh, one of the people at the Redskins game was a Navy officer, John Kennedy. John F. Kennedy was at the uh, Redskins game on December 7, 1941. But uh, so as the game progressed, there were more and more announcements for people to report to their offices, Admiral so and so, General such and such. And so people began leaving the stadium, and the players on the field heard all these announcements, but they had no idea what was going on. Uh, Sammy Ball, who was the quarterback for the Redskins, of course, he later said, we all knew something was going on, but we didn't know exactly what. And of course, the fans really didn't know what was going on. George Preston Marshall, who owned the team, later said he didn't want to upset people by announcing that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. But I think the truth is more that he was afraid everybody was going to leave and he would lose uh, all his concession sales for the last Sunday of the season. So. That was kind of how uh, he operated. Uh, in the press box in Washington, the news did come across the teletype. And there was a reporter for the Washington Post, a man named Shirley Povich, who was a very famous sports reporter at the time, father of Maury Povich of uh, daytime TV fame. But Shirley Povich uh, wrote a very, uh, very good article about how when the wire flashed the news that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, it was just the sports writers in the press box, this was Griffith Stadium, uh, the stadium the Redskins played in before uh, RFK, but only the sports writers in the press box knew that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor and that America would be going to war and how uh, uh, intense that feeling was to know you were the only people in the stadium who knew what was going on. And uh, it, it really was a momentous day, of course, in American history, but also in American sports history. The NFL, like it, at the time, was a whole different animal. It wasn't nearly the behemoth it is now. And so it really had to struggle, like a lot of Americans in a lot of industries and a lot of occupations during World War II on the home front. The NFL was part of, part of that struggle to sort of just get through the war. Yeah, that must have been just, like you said, being the only people in the stadium knowing what happened and did they end up telling people throughout or did they were they told to keep it a kind of a secret kind of thing or what happened there well Shirley povich talks about how inevitably the news began to ripple kind of beyond the uh, press box and at the time newspapers would publish extra editions and so even before the end of the game there were extra editions of the washington post and uh, the other Washington newspapers at the time on sale outside the stadium. So inevitably word got to people inside the stadium what was going on, not necessarily to the players on the field, however. And uh, the stadium, according to Shirley Povich, really was almost half empty by the end. All the news people had been sent back to their offices. There was one photographer left on the sideline, and that was it. And so it was... Uh, quite a historic day at Griffith Stadium. Nobody who went there that afternoon was expecting anything like this, of course. But uh, again, a lot of people's first memory of Pearl Harbor would be connected with an NFL game. The game in Chicago uh, was being broadcast nationwide on the radio, and the game was interrupted uh, with the announcement that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. So there you're talking possibly a million people uh, heard the news for the first time while they were listening to a broadcast of an NFL game. So December 7th is uh, really an important day in NFL history. And was that the Bears or was that the Cardinals? That was the Bears and the Cardinals. Uh, so the uh, the Chicago Derby, I guess you could call it, uh, was taking place. Uh, I think it was at uh, Wrigley Field. Obviously, they would play twice a year, once at Comiskey and once at Wrigley. Just to clarify, yeah, the Cardinals were in Chicago at the time. And, uh, of course, the Bears were in Chicago. The Bears were the team on the north side, and the Cardinals were the team on the south side. So they would usually end the season playing each other. And uh, so they were playing in New York. I'm sorry, they were playing in Chicago in New York. It was the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants. And in uh, Washington, it was the Eagles 
playing the Redskins at Griffith Stadium. So those were the three games. At the time, the NFL had a had a weird schedule. Well, it wasn't weird. It was just they didn't – not all the teams played every Sunday. So they would spread the games out throughout the year. So teams would have some uh, multiple weekends off. So uh, it's kind of like we have bye weeks now. So not everybody played every Sunday. And how many teams were in the league during that time? When the uh, war began in 1941, there were 10 teams in the league, five in the East and five in the West. So it was kind of a perfect setup for the league at the time. You know, you had, you had asked earlier, they were actually finished. 41, there was a tie for first place in the East. And it was, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it was a tie for first place in the West, I think it was, uh, Green Bay and Chicago. And it was the first time that this had ever happened, that they would have to have a divisional playoff. But of course, it came the week after Pearl Harbor, and nobody paid attention to it. The championship game in 41 uh, was the lowest attended championship game in uh, NFL history. And so you talk a little bit about how people felt after the war. I mean, obviously, this really took wind out of the sails of the NFL and of professional sports in general in the United States. I mean, people could not concentrate on sports. And uh, so it had that effect on the league for sure. In your interviews, research, and talking to different people, were you able to talk to anybody that was actually in one of those stands at the time or the press box? Ah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know that I talked to, I talked to the uh, nine guys who played for the Steagles, and I'm not sure I talked to anyone who actually played in one of the three games on December 7th of 41. Um, uh, most of my research for that was based on the newspaper reports. And then in memoir, Shirley Povich wrote a good memoir about his life as a sports writer. So I took a lot of stuff from that. And it's a shame now that you mentioned that it really would have been a good opportunity. Now we're getting so far away. I mean, I guess if there was a kid born in 31, uh, they might still be alive. There's probably a handful of people still alive, which kind of blows my mind, who were at that game in 1941. But I, I didn't really talk to anybody specifically who I knew was at that game. Yeah, that would have been... I don't even I don't have the right word because I don't want to say cool because, you know, it's just a sombering. But at the same time, to get a firsthand account would be, you know, my grandpa was born in 1930. He's the reason why I started this podcast and I call it the football history dude, because the running joke in my family is that he invented the word dude. And, you know, I've talked to him about, of course, the history of football and things like that and stuff that have happened. With that being said, you know, you said that it was kind of a trying time for Americans and we don't know what's going to happen. The closest thing I can relate it to in my lifetime would be the uh, September 11 bombings. And, and I do, of course, remember exactly where I was at that time. What was it like for people during the early years of the war? It was very, I think it was very traumatic. When I wrote the book, I, I interviewed the wives of the players as well, if, if, if they were still alive. And uh, really, it fell on them to kind of manage the household. And everything was rationed. I mean, you're talking about nylon for stockings and rubber for tire and gasoline, food, canned goods, fruit, shoes. Uh, everything was rationed. You would get a book of coupons from the government and it would take four coupons to buy a pair of shoes, and you got four coupons for shoes, what, maybe once a year. It was a, quite an adjustment to uh, everyday, to living everyday life in the country. The unemployment rate basically went down to zero. Uh, they couldn't hire enough people to keep the factories running. And of course, the draft. Uh, the draft had started in 1940, but once Pearl Harbor happened, it really ramped up. And now you're talking about millions and millions of men, roughly, uh, I think it was 18 to uh, 35, being called into the military. And of course, the, the effect that that has on society is that it changes the economic structure, the social structure, the cultural structure. All these people are, are going away. They're just disappearing. I mean, it's kind of like a twilight zone when you think about it, that you just take, you know, 10 million young men and just 
basically sucked them out of the out of the country. Uh, so there were huge psychological effects that came with uh, the war, not to mention the fear of the war itself and uh, whether we would win the war or not. So again, when you think of it in that context, it's you know football was a very insignificant uh, part of all this, but uh, but it was it was a part of it. You know, it was a part of it, and I think it's it's worth remembering for that. And you bring up a good point. So they say that unemployment goes down to zero percent. We can't get enough bodies in the factories. We can't do all these kinds of things. Then why would they have professional football at that time? And what happened there? Well, there were a couple of things. After Pearl Harbor, the president, Franklin Roosevelt, actually wrote a letter to the commissioner of baseball, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, and it's called the Green Light Letter because Landis, the commissioner of baseball, wasn't sure whether or not baseball should continue during the war. Roosevelt, who was actually a, a big sports fan and quite a football fan, played on the freshman team at Harvard, but he believed strongly that baseball should continue. Now, recognizing the fact that most of the able-bodied men will be inducted into the military and that the quality of the baseball won't be very good. So he gave baseball the green light, FDR did, and the NFL owners uh, took this as their own green light. Of course, the NFL was nothing compared to baseball at that time. Roosevelt didn't write a green light letter to Elmer Layden, the commissioner of the NFL at the time. But the owners took it as a sign that it was at least okay for them to continue the league through the war. There was a second thing, though, that helped the NFL, and that's this. The games were on Sunday. The players could actually work in other jobs during the week. And Sunday was the one day when most people had off. It was largely a six-day work week at the time because of the fact, you know, the, the, the demand for uh, materiel was so strong that uh, people had to work six days a week. Sunday was their only day off, and in the fall, it was perfect recreation for people to uh, to go to see a, an NFL game on Sunday. In fact, 1942 was a pretty disastrous season for the league, but in 1943, attendance spiked up to uh, a new record, uh, highest uh, average per game attendance the league had ever seen. And, and, the, and the stadiums were all in the city at the time. They were on streetcar lines. People didn't have to use gas rations. You know, it didn't have any wear on, on tire to affect uh, rubber consumption, that sort of thing. And so the NFL was really well placed. Once they got the go ahead implicitly from the green light letter, they were in a pretty good position to be able to try to make it through the war if they could find enough players. That was the problem. So many players were being called off to war that the NFL really stretched itself very thin during the war years. So then, how did they survive? How did we? get to the point where we were able to continue with the season and get these players to be able to play in the NFL? Well, uh, they did a couple of things. After the 1942 season, which was really pretty much a, a, a disaster for the NFL, they, they had so much trouble uh, finding enough players that in the summer of 43 at the league meetings before the 43 season, the Cleveland Rams were uh, suspended operations for the war. The owners were actually in the service at the time and were unavailable. And so they had no choice really but to suspend the Rams. And that brought the league down to nine teams. So between the lack of players and the unbalanced number of teams, nine is a little difficult uh, difficult number to schedule with. Uh, what they did is they decided we need to merge two teams. That would give us a nice balanced uh, league, two divisions, four teams each. And of course, it made the most sense for the NFL to merge the two teams in Chicago. But, you know, the Bears won the title in 42. The Cardinals were never any good, but they did have a few good players. And the, the other owners thought, well, you're just taking the, the Bears, this championship team, and making them even better. And so it wasn't the Bears and the Cardinals who ended up merging, but the two teams from Pennsylvania, the Steelers and the Eagles, whose owners all knew each other and got along with each other, and uh, they supported the idea. So in 43, at that, at that meeting in the summer of 43, it was officially uh, voted that the Steelers and the Eagles would merge. They would be called the Phil Pitt Combine, 
But of course, everybody called them the Steagles right away. And uh, that's how the Steagles were born. But filling the, the rosters was very difficult. At the time, I think the uh, I think the Steelers had 16 players under contract. Some teams only had six or seven players under contract because so many people have been called off to war. And so the league really had to rely on players who couldn't go off to war. And these would be guys who had some kind of physical defect that prevented them from being inducted into the military, but didn't prevent them from playing football. A lot of them were old football injuries, broken bones, perforated eardrums, repeated concussions, things like this would get you disqualified from serving in the military, get you uh, classified 4F, which was not fit for service. Uh, but still, you could play football. And those are the guys that the league and the Steagles especially really relied on. Uh, were guys who had been injured and couldn't go into the military, but could still play football. So that's kind of how the whole thing happened in 43. So they were not fit for military service, but they were fit enough for NFL? That's right. Um, so there are certain certain ailments or certain medical problems that people have that the uh, the military will never take you. Perforated eardrums, for instance. If you have a perforated eardrum, you would be very susceptible to any sort of chemical gas attack if you were in the uh, you know on the battlefield and there was some kind of gas attack. You the the gas could permeate through the perforation in your in your eardrum. So that was immediately a, a cause for rejection. Any partial blindness or deafness was immediate cause for rejection. Uh, the uh, Eagles had two guys on the line who were deaf in one ear. The center, Ray Graves, was deaf in one ear. Uh, they had a, um, a receiver, Tony Bova, who was blind in one eye. Uh, so those, these are the kind of things that under no circumstances would the military be able to take you, but you could still play football. Broken Bones was another one. Al Wister, who was a guard for the, uh, for the Eagles and played for the Steagles, it was his rookie year. He was from Michigan. He'd broken his arm and it had become infected. And so he was at risk of osteomyelitis, which is a bone disease. And so he was rejected from military service. And then there was another group of people who were the fathers. Until late 1943, fathers were exempted from the draft. So if you had a child that was born before Pearl Harbor, actually before they said if it was nine months and two weeks after Pearl Harbor, every child born up to then qualified you for an exemption from the draft which is one of the reasons the Bears were so good during the war. They had so many fathers. Uh, none of them got drafted. They were a veteran team, had lots of kids. And so uh, the Bears didn't do as bad as some of the other younger teams did during the war. So they kind of cobbled the rosters together that way. Yeah. One of my previous episodes was on the great Bronco Nagurski, and we discussed his comeback tour. And, uh, you know, going through your book, you discussed how you have, how there were many We'll call it the comeback tour kind of things. What were who were some of the players that you uh, researched for that? Well, one of my favorites was Bill Hewitt. Bill Hewitt was a All Pro end for the uh, Bears and the Eagles in the '30s, and he had retired. I think he'd been retired four or five years and came back to play for the Steagles in 1943. And uh, the problem was he had never worn a helmet. And 1943 was the first year that helmets were made mandatory. One of the reasons of that was because of the war. They were afraid players would get hurt, so they didn't want anybody playing bareheaded anymore. And so uh, when Bill Hewitt came back, he had to wear a helmet for the first and only time in his career and did not like it at all. Uh, as you mentioned, Bronco Nagurski came back. There were several guys who came out of retirement to play in the 43 season. I have to say none of them did particularly well. I think football is a tough game to, uh, to, to leave for three or four years and then, you know, just slide right back in. And I think Bill Hewitt had a lot of challenges, too. He, uh, he had a tough time uh, adjusting to, uh, uh, to, uh, to his return to football, I'd say. Of all the players that you interviewed, did you, were you able to interview any of the, the great comeback old veterans that were previous stars or was it just other players? Yeah, I wasn't able to to do that just because most of them were probably gone by the time I, I started writing the book in 2003. I was uh, I, I covered a reunion of the Steagles that was held in Pittsburgh, um, so that would have been the 60th anniversary of the Steagles, and that's where I did my first interviews with the players. 
And then uh, over the next year or two, I was able to interview. I think six showed up in Pittsburgh. There were three more that I tracked down, and I interviewed them as well. So there were nine living Steagles at the time. And just because of the way it worked, I mean, they were all, most of them were rookies. There were a couple of guys who had played for one or two years before 1943, but really nobody who had played much before that. I interviewed Ted Doyle. Ted Doyle was a guy, he got drafted by the Steelers in, I believe it was 39. So he actually played the last year they were still called the Pirates. You know, the uh, owners had this terrible habit. They were not very creative guys often. They had this terrible habit where they would just name the football team after the baseball team. So the Steelers were originally the Pirates. The Redskins were originally the Braves. They played in Boston. They just named them after the after the baseball team. Brooklyn Dodgers is one. So Ted Doyle had played for the Pirates, and then they became the Steelers in 1940, I believe. So he was one of the older guys I, I interviewed, but I didn't really interview any of the uh, any of the super old timers. I think most of them were were pretty much long gone by the early 2000s. So with it being mostly rookies, what do you think it was like for them coming into the league and, oh, wait, now I'm, wait, I'm playing for Philadelphia? Am I playing for Pittsburgh? And how did that whole thing work out having two different teams across the state like that? Well, what they did from a practical standpoint, they based the team in Philadelphia. And uh, most of the players were, Eagles. I would say about two thirds Eagles, one third Steelers. The uh, Steelers came to participate in the training camp in the in the in the summer, late summer of forty three. So that was really the most contentious time because you had guys who, you know, Ray Graves, who was the center for the Eagles, had started was the starting center for the Eagles in 1942. And then he showed up to camp, and all of a sudden there's this guy, Al Wuckus, who was the Steelers' starting center, and he became the starting center for the Steagles. And, and you know, uh, Ray Graves didn't think that was fair. It, it wasn't easy from a practical standpoint to bring these two teams together. As far as the, the young guy showing up, I remember Al Wistert. He was drafted by the Eagles. Uh, 43 was his rookie year. Uh, he he says he was at camp four or five days before he realized that the merger had even happened. He hadn't even heard about it. He hadn't read about it in the paper. This is how this is how not news it was in 1943. The NFL when um, he finally figured out, like, well, what do you? These guys are Steelers too. What's going on? So there was some definitely some animosity at the beginning when they did the merger. Uh, during the season, a lot of the Pittsburgh players would just work in Pittsburgh and then ride to train to Philadelphia or wherever on. Friday night, do one day of practice, and then play the game on Sunday. But the team was actually pretty good. Up to that point, the Steelers had only had one winning season in the franchise history. They came into the league in 33. Uh, The Eagles had never had a winning season. They also came in the league in 33. And the Steagles ended up having a winning season. They were 5-4-1, and just missed making the uh, winning the division by a game. And so I think the fact that they actually had a pretty successful season really improved camaraderie on the team as the season progressed. And the players got to know each other, and uh, most of them lived together in a hotel in Philadelphia. And so that also developed that kind of uh, that sense of team and community that I think developed you know, over the course of the year. So when they were together, considering the owners and the coaches and things like that, um, I'm thinking to nowadays of trying to put two, let's just call them type A personalities or egotistical type of guys. How did that transition for the the Steagles? <clears throat> well, not very well. The uh, Eagles coach, head coach, was a guy named Greasy Neal. And you're right, these were both type A personalities. Greasy Neal uh, was kind of a football genius. He really was. He he adopted the T formation after it came into uh, came into prominence in the in the uh, early forties. I mean, he was in his fifties. That's a pretty radical change, you know, to adopt a whole new offensive philosophy. But that's how Greasy was. He was a really kind of a thinker, kind of a an intellectual, very dapper guy. Always wore a, a fedora and a jacket on the sidelines. The Steelers' head coach was a guy named Walt Keesling, who was an old lineman. 
a big guy, probably 300 pounds still. And uh, he had played for the old Duluth Eskimos, blocking for Ernie Nevers. And he was a, you know, three yards in a cloud of dust, single wing formation guy. He didn't like the T formation. He thought it was, uh, you know, unsportsmanlike to pass the football. Real football was just running the ball into the middle of the line. And so when these guys got together, uh, it was really uh, like, uh, you know, cats and dogs. And finally, the uh, owner, one of the owners of the Eagles, I think it was Burt Bell, sat down with the two of them and said, look, we've got to do something here because they weren't getting along. And they decided that Greasy, the Eagles coach, would run the offense and Walt Keasley, the Steelers coach, would run the defense, which each of them preferred that. Greasy preferred. He, he liked offense and, and Keesling liked defense. And so it was really the first time in NFL history that you had this separation of offensive and defensive coaches. Yeah, it was funny. Uh, so Walt and Greasy did not get along. But the weird thing about it is they kind of gave birth to this whole system of having an offensive coach and a defensive coach up to that point if you would have assistant coaches they would be line coaches and backfield coaches you know somebody coached the line somebody coached the backfield the steagles were the first team to say we're gonna have somebody coach the offense and somebody coach the defense yeah that's something that i didn't even know about how they didn't have it before and out of necessity sometimes comes some of the greatest innovation so it's just kind of neat to hear how, again, two type A personalities that didn't work out so well, just like some animosity in the nation. And then all of a sudden, we pony up, we get together, we go get the job done. In last week's episode, I left my fans a little bit of a cliffhanger. I didn't let them know what was going to happen at the end of the season. I didn't even tell them the, uh, the outcome. So you said it was, what, 5-4-1? and one? Yeah, they... Um... They finished five, four, and one. I believe they were uh, a half game behind the Redskins in the East. If they'd won their last game, if they'd beaten Green Bay in the last game of the season, there would have been a three way tie in the Eastern Division with three teams at six, three, and one. So it saved the NFL a lot of uh, heartache by the Steagles losing that last game of the season. So they didn't have this crazy three-way tie. Uh, we were talking a little bit about, I had mentioned earlier, the helmet rule that the players had to wear helmets for the first time in uh, 43. The other big rule they did, the rule change they made in 1943, is that for the first time they allowed unlimited substitution. Until then, a player could only uh, enter the game, I think it was once, you know, uh, could come out of the game once each quarter, except twice in the fourth quarter. So basically, the same 11 guys who started the game were the same 11 guys who played the whole game. Offense, defense, kicks, punts, everything. These 11 guys just played everything. The 60-minute men. So to uh, cut down on injuries, they decided to have unlimited substitution. You could change as many players as often as you want. Problem was the coaches were didn't really understand how you could use this, how you could tune whole offenses and defenses. And they never really it took a few years before they figured out, oh, we can have a complete offensive team and a complete defensive team. But 43 was the first year where you could just come and go every play. And it was the first time that uh that had happened in the NFL. So, there you go. 1943, the Steagles. A year of firsts, including the first time deploying a separate offensive and defensive coach. The first year the league had unlimited substitutions. The Eagles on one side, the Steagles on the other side. But they would be joined together to help save the league forever. But this is not the whole story. And I sure hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets from a subject matter expert. Mr. Matthew Algio. I created a page on the website for all of Matthew's books, and you can get there by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com slash Matthew Algio. That's Matthew A-L-G-E-O. Again, head to thefootballhistorydude.com slash Matthew Algio for a list of all of his books. 
Now, next week, we finish the fight for NFL dominance during the World War II era by going in depth with Matthew about some of the stories from players he interviewed, alternate realities, and we get to hear where he's taking the DeLorean when I toss him the keys and he's getting that baby up to 88 miles per hour. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.